Chapter 3, Section 4, The Structure of Proteins, Primary Structure. Our proteins, whether they're enzymes, structural protein, or glycoprotein, lipoprotein, whatever, the structure of proteins is so complex that our brains, we have trouble you know, trying to figure it out. So what we have done is we have come up with a mechanism for discussing the levels of complexity. We have artificially put in four levels, first, second, third, fourth, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, okay? Boom. Four levels that we can discuss a protein, an enzyme, you know, structural protein, a lipoprotein, glycoprotein, whatever, four levels of structure that we can discuss that protein and its complexity at. First level, primary, is the most rudimentary. Quartney level, that's the more advanced. Here's the complete structure of this protein, thus it has, we can discuss its function. When you look at the figure right here, hopefully you remember from BSE 244, cell biology, if you've had that already. Primary structure is nothing more than the string of amino acids. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, hundredth, six hundredth, a thousandth, however many amino acids. The sequence of amino acids is specified by the gene that's on the chromosome. Got to remember, the genes, your genes, whether yours, your dog, your cat, your goldfish, the tree outside, the bacteria in your gut, the gene is nothing more than a blueprint on how to assemble the primary structure of an enzyme. Or, I'm sorry, primary structure of a polypeptide, which can then be an enzyme or a structural protein, a lipoprotein, glycoprotein, whatever. There's, this is where those peptide bonds come into play. You join two together, you now have a dipeptide, join three, tripeptide, four, more oligopeptide, and so on. Within a given portion of that primary structure, that link, that string of amino acids, the shape of the amino acids are gonna push and pull against each other. And we'll talk more about this in the next chapter, how they do this. They push and pull against each other in such a way that they're either going to form this coil, known as an alpha helix, or this sheet, this up-down folded sheet called a beta pleated sheet. That's secondary structure. Tertiary structure is, you know, your textbook refers to it as a 3D folding. Well, it's nothing more than the sequence of alpha helix, beta sheet, loops. And they start to push and pull against each other and holding themselves together to form a polypeptide. Alpha helix, loop, beta sheet, loop, beta sheet, loop, alpha helix, blah, blah, blah. Here's where the R groups. Ionic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, where they come into play to hold that polypeptide shape that you see right there, the tertiary structure, together. Now, as I said, well, you know what? Sometimes the final protein, the quaternary structure, needs multiple polypeptides. That hemoglobin, two alphas, two betas. They're held together by hydrogen bonds, disulfide bonds, and so on and so forth. Quaternary structure is whatever the final protein is, however many polypeptides, one or a dozen, as we saw in the previous lecture in that table. Shape dictates function. The overall shape of a protein is going to be started at the primary structure. What are the amino acids? Different amino acids strung together are going to form different, you know, are, some are going to form an alpha helix, some are going to form beta sheet, and how they're now strung together 
is going to give you a different sequences of alpha, of helices, beta sheets, loops, and stuff. But it all starts the primary. Turns out many of our proteins are what they refer to as polymorphic. Slight changes in the amino acids still gives you the correct or close enough to the correct shape, so you still have a function. It's interesting, if we went through and everybody in our class, we decide to sequence one specific gene. Well, it turns out there's going to be differences in the AGC sequence of our genes, thus there's gonna be a slight difference in the amino acid sequence. But when we isolate, we go through all those steps discussed in the last section, in section three, to purify or attempt to purify a protein from each of our cells, protein's still gonna be roughly the same. Yeah, somewhere embedded in it may be a slight change of amino acid, things like that. Some are gonna have even bigger changes. That's their, you know, they're gonna have increased activity or decreased activity. Those are just these vagrancies, these variances they're talking about. It's still the same protein, still does the same job, still has roughly the same shape, even though we come from completely different lineages within, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens. There are many, many different ways to sequence proteins. You can go through and label the proteins. You know, wherever there's a tyrosine, you know, that's going to be this color, wherever serine, blah, 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 blah. Or you go through and you start breaking down the different parts. Um, the different parts sections, sometimes they refer to these as motifs. You know, here's a motif, you know, the alpha helix. Or here's a motif that's going to be a beta sheet. You go through and you start pulling those apart. And, you can start sequence that way. Turns out that there are compounds that you can insert or have them associate with your polypeptide, your protein you want to study. Here above my head are some of them that you can go through and you can use to label. You can have them interact with different amino acids and then you'll go through and you'll see you know what the concentration the higher the concentration the more of your you know whatever you're labeling with is going to be present the less and you can start going through and you know calculate back calculate what amino acids are there what's their overall seat you know percentages and things like that Another mechanism, and this is old school, is to go through and treat the different polypeptides with different solutions, different compound solutions. You're going through and try to see how many you know, disulfide bonds are present, how strong are they. You know, <clears throat> the overall strength of the disulfide bonds is going to be dependent upon, you know, is it a surface or is it buried within? How much, you know. How much do you have to sit there and change the overall pH or the overall concentration of your solution to you denature? You break down the quaternary, the tertiary structure of that polypeptide. You can also go through with proteases and start cutting. Proteases, a uh, rule of thumb in biology and biochemistry and whatnot anything that ends in a's is an enzyme what prefaces a's prefaces a's is tells you what it does or what it associates with proteases are enzymes that go and in, cut up proteins you see here in table 3.6 different enzymes different proteases that you're going to find in animals and bacteria. They have different targets. Trypsin. Uh, we have trypsin in us, but this trypsin that they studied was isolated from bovine pancreas. Goes through and cuts wherever there is a lysine and arginine. Cut, cut, cut. Other proteases just start at the carboxy terminal and start cutting up towards the end terminal. Some of them have specific amino acids. They go, they find, they cut there. 
So you can go through the more cuts, the more fragments you will see when you run a gel. Nowadays, we do what's referred to as mass spec. Okay. Previous slides, those were more old school ways of doing it back before we had computers that could sit there and go through and do thousands of calculations a second, millions, depending upon how strong good your computer is. Mass spec is exactly the mass type of mass spec you've seen in other chemistry courses. You superheat, you know, your sample, it goes through, you know, goes through and it's analyzed what's coming through at when. Turns out different amino acids are going to, you know, go through at different points. You know, is this a terminal amino acids also going to have an issue? So you can know what's going through when, time-wise, what's the concentration, and so on. Doing this, we can go through and we can study what is now referred to as the proteome. Proteome is all the proteins present in a cell genome all the genes present on the chromosome of a cell proteome genome and so on so you analyze you ionize these your analytes your you know extracts your purified protein or whatever however you purified it sds or the 2d gels that i've, I've done that you go and you cut out that one little dot because you know it's now isolated it's the only thing there with the pi the isoelectric point and that size you cut that part out of the gel you send it off to you know the lab that does mass spec they take it they ionize they uh put it into a magnetic field see what goes through and when Nowadays, they also have what is referred to as MALDI MS, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization mass spectrometry. So instead of going through and having to cut out and send in and do all this, they can just bombard your sample, you know, that's now been separated out in that gel and whatnot. They go through and they do this, and it's roughly the same as mass spec, but now they're using lasers to ionize and do things like that. The electro spray, well, what if you have your protein of interest instead of being separated out in a gel or some mean, the mechanism like that? Well, what if you just did, you know, chromatography? So you can take what you think is a purified protein and you spray it through a sample. And as it goes through, voltage ionizes it goes through it hits a mass spectrometer you know who goes through and when and all the amino acids have been sent through this because you have a known you know here's all my knowns so you can calibrate the machine and you see who comes off and when so you've broken down everything and you're sending it through boom 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 the computer will compile who goes through and when and what based on time of flight, you know, all sorts of other physics like the orbit trap that we're not going to worry about. And it can go through and start trying to determine who, what, when. Start laying out potential amino acid sequence that would meet, you know, the data you know okay here we know it's these 20 amino acids is most you know some of them are going to have a lot of some are going to have a few now, how can we assign these in a certain order putting together the primary structure in a certain way so that it meets our criteria of who came through when and all that tandem mass spec roughly the same thing liquid chromatography MS, as things are going through the, you know, the, the, you're doing the chromatography, things are dripping through. One set of collecting and all that, you're running the mass spec as it's going through. So you know these are the different aliquots I want to collect. 
And you also know, get an idea of what are the amino acids. Not the complete chain. It's not going to give you the complete chain all at once. Okay? Uh, can't do that. That's too many calculations too fast. But it'll give you the first few. First few dozen. And then you can go through and compare, do what's referred to as a BLAST search. Forget what the acronym BLAST stands for, but it's numerous websites where you can take your DNA or amino acid sequence and you compare them to all known. You know, they keep databases of this and it can tell you this is your protein. Here's the rough sequence of it. If we know the sequence, we know what the primary structure should be, we can assemble this ourselves. We can go through and alter concentrations of the amino acids in our solution. And as we alter, raise and lower the concentrations, add more, you know, it gets used up, we add indifference and blah, blah, blah. We can force the assembly of very small polypeptides. Um, are we going to be able to get the complete polypeptide for, you know, a big protein like some of them we've discussed? No, this is too labor intensive. It wouldn't work after a certain size. I forget what that size is. It just goes wonky. Um, so far, we cannot, in a test tube, replace what Mother Nature does with mRNA, ribosomes, and tRNA. We're just not there. What's interesting, nowadays, as you're going through in your sequencing, and you're doing your BLAST searches against databases, it's not just looking for you know, amino acid one, two, three, four, five, are they all the same? Yes, no, then this is what it must be. They're looking for patterns in the sequence. Because as I said, between us, you know, the students and me in this course, we're gonna have slightly different amino acids in every one of our proteins, but they still function the same way. Well, when you go from us, to bonobos, us to chimpanzees, your dog, your cat. We all have cytochrome C. You know, you see that one used a lot because that's one we've really characterized, we've studied. We all have cytochrome C because we all have, you know, mitochondria and all that. We all do oxidative phosphorylation. But when you go and you compare our sequence, well, between us humans, there's going to be some slight variability. Between us bonobos, it gets even more. Between us and mice, even more. But when you go through and you start comparing the amino acid sequence, well, those differences get a little smaller. As you see in the figure above my head here, you know, which place, you know, which amino acid in there from the N terminal to the C terminal, you'll start to see that there's patterns. The bigger the letter, the more often than not, you see either that amino acid there or you see a certain within its group or closely related amino acid. They have roughly the same structure or they're all ionic or they're all hydrophobic, they're all nonpolar, whatever. And you can see that they start to appear more often when you compare against different animals. The ones that are shrunk down, you can't really tell. There's too much variability there. You can't really make any consensus on a pattern there. But you start going out across more and more amino acids, and you start comparing more and more amino acid sequence between organisms, between species. You can see that there's more and more of a pattern of what is or is not occurring. This is what scientists who are into what is referred to as bioinformatics, bio life informatics. You're using computers to, to compare the numbers, to compare the letters, the amino acids, the AGCT DNA or RNA sequences. You're not looking for exact matches because you're never going to find that. Even between us humans, there's never going to be exact matches. And as you go from species to species, those matches are going to get fewer and fewer. But as it shows right there, you can start looking at amino acid residues. You know, the first five of this protein, the amino acids are always going to be roughly this 
or something close to it. The next 10, eh, the next 14, the same or close to the same. And you start to see this pattern. That's what bioinformatics is looking for. Because what we see is there's what that's referred to as horizontal gene transfer. Okay, genes transferred from one organism to another. Okay, I'm not talking, you know, from your mom and dad to you. That's vertical. You to your offspring, whenever you have them, that's vertical. But we see that between organisms, um, if you've ever been infected with certain viruses, you know, their genes inserted into your DNA, they're now stuck with you horizontal. Uh, we see this between bacteria. They swap back and forth pieces of the chromosomes, pieces of the plasmid or entire plasmids back and forth. We're starting to look at this. How often does this occurred amongst animals, plants, things like that. So I've been saying over the past few slides that we have the same gene. We have the same, you know, not the same gene, sorry, the same proteins, proteins that are the same, doing the same job cytochrome C. But the cytochrome C in us and in mice, us and in a mollusk, yeah, the amino acid sequence is not going to be anywhere near the same. But we have a cytochrome C, they have a cytochrome C, thus they are what is referred to as homologs. They're not the exact same because we're not the same species but they do homologous or the same job. They have roughly the same structure that does the same function. Between us humans, you have what's referred to as paralogs, okay? Yes, there's going to be some variability on um, amino acids that really don't matter. They're there for structure, just to hold everything together in that whole three-dimensional shape. The active site, eh, is it gonna be pretty much the same or, you know, close enough. Homologs that are between different species, those are known as orthologs. So all the cytochrome C's across all eukaryotes are homologous to each other. Those homologs between us humans, paralogs between us, the goldfish, orthologs. And we can go through and we can compare this, find that Proteins are going to be roughly the same between animals, between, you know, eukaryotes. They're going to be homologous. And as you see on this example here, they're using two prokaryotes, two bacteria, Escherichia coli and Bacillus solidus. You go through and you look at, you know, okay, again, you're comparing amino acid sequence using the one letter designation. And you see that, well, there's really not a lot where they're the same, except in the shaded areas. And you notice the shaded areas, you know, there's a pattern. There's a repeating pattern. What this tells us is these, whatever this protein is, I forget I'd, what the textbook says it is. There's enough of these pattern of they're the same throughout that we consider these two proteins to be homologous to each other. They're from completely different species, completely different lineages, evolutionary lineages, but they perform the same role. They're going to have close to the same shape. Using this, we can start comparing. You've seen the family tree. You've seen you know, how you can go through and, you know, do the different evolutionary trees. Well, this is an evolutionary tree that instead of being, you know, horizontal spread out, they just did it as a circular. So you can see the pinwheel pattern of things, you know, that are closely related and how they branch out from some common ancestor way down here common ancestor that branched out the species, branching, branching, branching. And you see here, up here at the very top, this is what are gonna be pretty much our modern day.